Uh, let me just say, uh, energy production and use is, is a large and still growing domain. Um, the availability and use of energy is dependent on the capacity of the planet to supply many resources and also the capacity of the sinks of the planet to absorb waste products. BP has recognized these linkages and set itself the goal of better understanding them. It set up the Energy Sustainability Challenge program to understand whether pressures on natural resources might constrain the way the world produces energy. We thought that understanding the science would help clarify what we have to factor in in terms of technology and policy solutions as we transition to supplying energy for the 21st century market. Let me just say what this talk's going to uh, cover. Um, a little bit of, of context around um, energy futures. Um, uh, a little bit talking about um, energy consumption and energy sources. Uh, I'm going to introduce the links between energy and natural resources, which is uh, just some insights from what we've learned from our experience um, in running the program, uh, and in, in particular, running a multi-university collaborative program. And, uh, and then I, I want to uh, just dive into a little bit more detail, in, in, uh, just to give you some glimpses in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a couple of areas um, uh, on water and minerals. Um, but then I'd really like to move into a discussion and thought might move that discussion towards the, uh, the role of materials, which I think is the interest of people on this. Um, so thinking about the, uh, the context in which uh, we're working in the energy system, um, population and income are the key drivers behind growing demand for energy. And if you look at the, uh, uh, the chart on the left here of projected increase, in population, you'll see the world's population is projected to increase around by around one and a half billion people to reach nearly uh, uh, 8.8 billion people by 2035. And then over the same period, um, gross domestic product is expected to more than double, um, with around one fifth of that coming from population growth and four fifths from improvement in productivity and productivity per person. Uh, we also expect China and India together to account for almost half of that increase in, uh, in, in global uh, uh, gross domestic product. Um, and we expect the, uh, the OECD economies to account for around a quarter of that. So then when you combine that with looking at, at what that means in terms of consumption uh, by region, and this is uh, from the, the BP Energy Outlook. I mean, nobody can predict the future with a, uh, a, a crystal ball, but it is, it is a, uh, a projection. Uh, we, we see that that translates into uh, a growing um, uh, energy growth, um, more industry, more people um, uh, moving around. And so that's, that's, the, that's the, the frame that we have uh, for, for thinking about this, for starters, in terms of where demand for energy is going. We also just think a little bit about um, energy supply. Our analysis has shown that the world has abundant technically accessible resources to meet global energy demand through to 2050. Um, this uh, it shows that we estimate the total energy theoretically accessible to around 450 billion tons of oil equivalent per year. It's more than 20 times. Uh, expected annual demand. And um, one theme I'll, I'll come to is uh, what a billion tons of oil equivalent is just over 40 exajoules. Um, the current use of primary energy was probably around 500, 600 exajoules a year. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep on coming back to the theme of, 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 of units uh, because as, as I think we'll appreciate uh, the, uh, the people who are on this call, the SI system is a really helpful system, and it's good just to be able to get uh, an idea of, of, the, of, the, of the magnitude of the relationships between energy and various other resources. And they're often hidden under, under obscure units, uh, such as, uh, um, uh, with all due respect to the people from Illinois who are on this, uh, acre feet of water, which is uh, um, uh, very helpful, I guess, when you're in the uh, agricultural business, but, but, but uh, doesn't help those of us brought up in the SI system. Um, and, uh, and that's not a dig, it's just a, an observation that if we can have the common units, it really helps. Um, and, and what we believe is that technology can unlock 
plentiful supplies of almost all forms of energy, from fossil fuels to sunlight and wind. Um, several of these resources could theoretically meet all primary demand on their own. Um, however, resources, both fossil and non-fossil, are unequally distributed, and hence one region's best choices will differ from another. The absolute volumes of resource here are less important than other factors, other factors such as cost of supply, or the energy density, or remoteness from centers of demand. Also, supply chain constraints and intermittency, which uh, we, we, we see with wind and, and solar in particular. And when taken together, this means only a limited proportion of their full potential will, will need to, to be uh, accessed by 2050. And so the, the question is a bit uh, more like, um, will, not will we have enough energy, but more of what kind of, of energy do we want? Um, and so growing demand and uh, and and, and plentiful resources uh, from different areas. Um, and we then think, well, how is that linked to other resources? Energy production and usage is linked to many natural resources. Um, and uh, uh, this was the, the, the center of uh, our studies in the Energy Sustainability Challenge uh, program. Um, just thinking about the linkages between energy and the atmosphere, and this uh, uh, diagram with, with, with arrows which broadly proportional to the magnitude of linkages. Um, the atmosphere, there are close linkages to the carrying capacity of the atmosphere. Nearly 60% of greenhouse gases are from fossil fuel use, whilst nearly 30% are from agriculture and land use change. And considering links to land, biofuels use around 2% of global crop land. Thinking about um, materials, approximately 10% of global primary energy is used in the mining and processing of materials. And uh, it's been estimated that around 5% of steel is, is used in the oil and gas industry. Also, looking at the linkage between water and energy, water is needed for using oil or gas and for oil refining processes to produce fuels, and indeed for most generation of electricity. And now let's try and put these amounts into perspective. Globally, renewable fresh water resources of somewhat over 40,000 cubic kilometers are available each year. And humans withdraw about a tenth of that, it's around 4,000 cubic kilometers. That's 4,000 billion cubic meters, uh, equivalent to around 600 cubic meters per person, as an average across the whole world. Now, obviously, great regional. Uh, differences. And um, of that 4,000 billion cubic meters that uh, humanity withdraws, around 2,700 is withdrawn for food, nearly 500 uh, uh, billion cubic meters are uh, withdrawn for energy, and 800 for domestic and industrial use. And most of the fresh water withdrawn for the energy sector is for thermal power generation, for cooling, and most of that is returned to water courses albeit at a slightly higher temperature, um, and some evaporates and is essentially lost uh, from the local catchment area. Um, and, 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 and this really points to one of the, uh, the facets of distinguishing between um, uh, withdrawal and consumption uh, in, uh, in, in water use, uh, and the need to get really clear metrics of, uh, of, of, of these things, which was part of the, uh, the purpose of the, of, of the project. Um, and trying to get beyond reacting to uh, uh, headlines, but trying to put everything into um, uh, uh, a numeric, um, uh, well thought out set of metrics. Um, and oil, gas, and coal production also require um, water for uh, uh, displacing oil and gas, for fracturing rock to produce gas, or suppressing coal dust. Um, we estimate that somewhat less than 0.5% of global freshwater withdrawals uh, are used for that. The challenge with water is it's a local issue. Its availability depends on where you are in the world. Um, and so let's just consider a, a couple of cases relating to BP's main uh, sector, oil and gas. But that's an overall frame for beginning to think about the, uh, the linkages between energy and natural resources. Um, and also for setting a frame of thinking, are there trade-offs, other ways of optimizing uh, the, the, the system. If you use water for one purpose, does that mean that you can't use it for something else? 
um, and what's the implication of that. And so that's a, a, a basic theme that I'll, I'll come back to in this uh, uh, talk and really like to discuss with you because I think you know, materials are also part of the, uh, of, of the global system and it'd be interesting to understand where they fit in that uh, and, and can fit in, in, in enabling energy to be um, available, not just where we want it, not just produced, but uh, so it's used efficiently. Just thinking about water usage and oil and gas uh, production, and I've, I've got a, a couple of images, one from uh, North American uh, gas production at the um, Anadarko area, and then the uh, one on the right is uh, uh, the field in Egypt, the uh, Sakara development. Um, it's almost always needed for using oil and gas. And to maximize productivity, water is injected through dedicated wells to displace the oil or gas from the pores of the rock and push the valuable fossil fuel up through production wells. There it's treated and where possible recycled or reused. For conventional oil production on land, the average freshwater consumption intensity is estimated as 21 cubic meters per terajoule. Terajoule is about three quarters of a barrel of oil. If you include offshore production, the world average freshwater intensity is about 15 cubic meters per terajoule. At this stage, let's put these units into perspective. And uh, I guess if I was in a room with everybody here, I'd be interesting to get your own perspectives on, 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 on this. Um, but we can't do that quite here. Um, so one terajoule is about the energy content of a road tanker full of gasoline. Global oil production per year is, is maybe 200 million times that amount, a few hundred exajoules. The, uh, the solar energy received on the planet every minute is around six exajoules. So just uh, um, uh, worth putting these into uh, uh, perspective. Um, but a declining amount of fresh water use in fossil fuels extraction um, due to reuse and replacement by lower quality water has been documented in several areas of the world. Uh, so generally, where uh, the uh, industry can use a lower quality water, um, that's, that's the way it's moving to. Natural gas is the most water efficient fossil fuel. Conventional gas freshwater consumption intensity averaging less than a cubic meter per terajoule, as compared with the, the average freshwater conventional oil production of 21 cubic meters per terajoule. Estimates for water consumption in the US shale gas between 3 and 17 cubic meters of terajoule. Less than half a percent of all human freshwater withdrawals are used to extract fossil fuels and, and uranium. And that corresponds to about 9 billion cubic meters. So just thinking about water usage in oil refining, and this is taken from uh, our refinery in White England, I guess the, uh, the people in, in Illinois. No, as a near neighbor. Let's uh, think about refining. The process of refining oil to produce diesel or gasoline uses water in significant quantities, withdrawing about 12 times the volume of throughput. And, and consuming, that is evaporating the atmosphere, about half a cubic meter per cubic meter of oil process. The big difference between withdrawal and what's consumed. 12 times withdrawn, half uh, uh, evaporated. Um, and these, these correspond to around uh, 270 meters cubed per terajoule uh, withdrawn and, and 13 cubic meters per, per terajoule consumed. And um, maybe I should have uh, said it earlier in a uh, uh, reminder, perhaps people are, are, are very clear with their, their large numbers, exajoule, 10 to the power of 18 uh, million terajoules. Um, and so it, it, once again, really clear to be about our, clear about our definitions and, uh, and, and units and be clear to distinguish between withdrawal and consumption. So um, those are a, 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 a couple of little insights of, of water use in, um, in the more traditional energy industry um, and, uh, and, and some of the results of, of the energy sustainability challenge in digging around to get good, good data. Um, because it, 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 what's worth saying is there are lots of reports and there's lots of footprinting that, that's been going on, but
but it really needs going back to the, uh, the source data and getting current data to get a, um, a, a, a good handle on it. Let me now just talk a little bit about a, another dimension of, uh, of natural resources and, uh, and energy, and that's um, uh, minerals in electric vehicles. We've got a picture of electric vehicles and, and salt lakes. Um, this is an example of how changes in technologies for energy use need to be assessed against physical availability of natural resources. I'm sure that all of us on this call are seeing more and more electric vehicles. Reported that there were just over half a million, 565,000 globally in 2015, with an 80% increase over 2014 um, uh, in, in Europe. Um, but once again, we need to put this into context. That's out of 70 million cars of all types sold uh, globally in 2015. So you know, half a million out of uh, 70 million, less than one. If you look at the International Energy Agency two degree scenario, their, their high electrification two degree scenario, 59% of passenger vehicles sold in 2050 would be either full electric vehicles or plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Let me emphasize this is just a hypothetical scenario, but under that lithium requirements and cobalt and nickel would increase substantially. Under the most aggressive scenario, in 2050, 88% um, of currently known reserves of lithium would be depleted. Annual production would be 22 times more than what the world is using today. Under the 50% recycling case, the cumulative demand would be, re would, would be uh, uh, re reduced, just maybe 67% of currently known reserves. However, this would require recycling 240,000 tons of lithium per year around seven times today's production capacity. Um, now, around half of lithium reserves are booked in Chile, where nature has, has uh, concentrated the element in lakes, uh, similar to the one shown on the right. I also didn't have a, photo a, 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 a photograph that had permission to use. So this I had to make do with one that came from, from my camera of a, of, a, of, a, of a similar lake in the high Andes. So I'm sorry you're getting the, uh, the, the camera and slideshow, but well, you know, this is, this is what we have to do. Um, uh, but so this is an example of an interesting um, materials problem, materials around um, base elements. Um, and uh, I, 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 well, what I'll say in this is people often talk about um, uh, uh, lithium, but you need to consider the others. You need to think about um, cobalt, uh, given where a large proportion, um, around 50% of, of cobalt produced in the Democratic Republic of Congo last year. Uh, and, and so you, you, you need to, to think of, of where materials come from and what that means uh, for their future uh, development. But generally, uh, uh, more reserves are booked as needed and, and people are able to ramp up production. Um, so anyway, an interesting materials problem, but I uh, think that the disciplines of people in this webinar may hold even more solutions as the energy system is transformed in the future. Um, and this is really what I'd uh, like to explore as I, as I begin to move to uh, uh, this, this discussion phase of, uh, of, of, of this. But let me just um, talk about the benefit of having a systems approach that ensures clarity of context so that decisions in any one technical domain can be taken in a way that's optimal for the whole system. Also, the, the approach of having good scientific discipline on metrics and units ensures relative magnitudes are transparent. We saw the example with water consumption and water withdrawal. And I've mentioned how, how having consistent units is really helpful. And also, these two aspects enable priorities to be decided on and clarify the motivation uh, for research. Uh, it means that we're not just focusing in one narrow area of the energy domain, but we understand how it relates to the, the, the global system on which we're, we're part of. Now, we want to understand what are the big problems, what's worth working on. And in the BP-sponsored work under the Energy Sustainability Challenge, we fostered collaboration between research institutes and across disciplines. Um, and in some ways, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, exciting and interesting. Um, I appreciate there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a natural setup with four institutions in, in ICAM. Um, we were running across 15, uh, 16 institutions. Um, don't get, uh, you don't get natural uh, 
uh, collaboration as as of right. But um, but we, we we encouraged it and, and it came along and and, and be, be great to hear about your experiences and in, in, in how that works um, and if there are experiences that um, that we have that we can share. But uh, but getting people together and getting them focused on what are are, are interesting big problems at the start. Um, and then thinking about the multidisciplinary approach. I mean, it makes me think. So what role is there for material specialists? Um, sensors to uh, uh, understand uh, the the linkages between the different parts of the systems, membranes for improving desalination. How can we improve efficiencies and minimize waste? Uh, can we lightweight things or get things to the right weight? Um, where's better insulation possible? Better seals? And and before we we really provoke the discussion around where materials fit in that, um, let me just sidetrack into a, a piece of work from. Our research partners, I should say, was done before the BP funding from John Cullen and Julian Allwood at Cambridge, and shows the global energy system um, and how about 88% of primary energy is lost or degraded and wasted. And 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 uh, looking at this Sankey diagram, where each line, um, the width of the line is proportional to the amount of the energy, enabling you to trace where the energy goes. The left-hand side shows the primary uh, energy sources with the uh, units in, in exajoules, uh, so showing oil of around 152 uh, exajoules, and, and you trace that through the grey, showing it mostly goes into um, uh, uh, engines, but how a, a lot of that ends up wasted as, as heat. Only a small blue line comes out uh, uh, from that, which is, is, is going into motion. Obviously, you can see that um, when you trace through uh, the primary energy that's used into electricity, a little bit of the gray line on the left going through into electricity in the in the uh, center of the of, of the screen, um, and and obviously a lot of gas used in in, in electricity, and then you see a portion of that that's used in electric motors, and then that's quite efficiently converted um, uh, into in, in, into into motion. Um, uh, there's, there's much less uh, loss. So I, um, I, I, I put up uh, this as a, uh, as a means of having a, a frame, um, and, I, and I, I, uh, I think that's one of the, the, the things I, I advocate for in this work is having a, a global frame so you can then drill down into, into what's really important and, 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 you, and, and start looking at it. Well, what, what do you really knew, need to do so that of all that uh, 500 exajoules of primary energy on the left, um, we can we can uh, do uh, rather better than getting just useful energy of uh, uh, of um, uh, 55 exajoules um, out the right hand side, just the, the motion, um, heat, and uh, and cooling light and, and, and sound, with so much wasted in uh, in uh, uh, heat loss. Uh, and, and friction, and indeed um, uh, uh, fuel losses in, in transit uh, here. I, um, I, I hope my cursor is being seen on the screen. Yes, it is. That's that's that's, that's fine. So really, that uh, kind of sets the scene for a, uh, a discussion. And uh, and I would also um, like to say, well, are there any actual pointers um, from from nature that we uh, might be able to to think about? Um, personal uh, interest of mine, and I'd, and I'd love to get discussion going on that. Um, and so if you think of, of pointers from nature, and excuse the pun on that for those who, who realize that is a, a pointer, um, but you know, you just you just think of what's possible with insulation. I mean insulation and light weighting has to be they have to be two of the of the things that would make most difference to the global energy system. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I can uh, you know, you you can, you can look at the uh, the insulation that's on polar bears that has a they have a, a black skin, uh, but then a, a, a sort of translucent fur. Uh, I mean, there, there has to be, have to be designs to improve insulation. So I'm hoping to be besieged by good ideas of all the work you're you're doing on that and hear about that. Um, I mean, I, I make the observation of seals. I mean, you know, seals can be very good on on, on dogs. You don't know, <laughs> methane leakage. Um, when people are worrying about methane leakage, something must be right. Um, light weighting, pretty pretty slim. Uh, sensors. I think we all know about the capability of of, 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 uh, of, of sensors. Um, so really, without uh, uh, further ado, as I said, I'll take about um, um, half the time. 
I'd, I'd like to uh, move to provoking some discussion amongst yourself as where do you think developments in materials could make a real difference and, 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 and what would it take to, uh, to make it happen?